I will now introduce today's speaker, who's not much older than all of you, except she's even younger than... Where are you? There's a couple of people that are older, anyway. Uh, this is Riley Gaines right here. Uh, Riley's a recent graduate of the University of Kentucky, which she's proudly sporting there on the shirt where she was on the swim team, and not only was she on the team, she was a 12-time NCAA All-American. Five-time SEC champion. SEC record holder of the 200 butterfly. I do the 100 butterfly, so it's totally different. <laughs> Can't even do the butterfly. <laughs> anyway, uh, two-time Olympic trial qualifier. Uh, Riley competed with and tied transgender swimmer Leah Thomas at the NCAA Championships. And guess what we're talking about today, kids? <laughs> Silicon Valley Bank. <laughs> All right, please <laughs> up. Neither Silicon Valley Bank. <laughs> um, but I'm 22, so hopefully I'm not too much older than a lot of you guys. Um, but as he said, my name is Riley Gaines. Um, I am a recent graduate from the University of Kentucky. I find myself wearing blue more often than not because we get so many shirts. Um, but you guys have a really amazing swim team at this school, so really cool stuff. I have lots of friends that swim here still swim here. Um, they're actually in Tennessee right now, which is where I'm from, um, and they're competing at their NCAA championships. So I'm going down to watch tomorrow. So super exciting stuff. Um, but I wanted to give you guys a little background on myself. Um, like I said, I went to University of Kentucky where I majored in human health sciences and health law. Um, I had every intention of this year being in dental school. Um, I actually was set to pursue endodontics, which is like root canals and stuff. And so I've decided to kind of put that off this past year to do kind of exactly what I'm doing right now and what I've been doing this past year because I realized that dental school will always be there, but the relevance and the importance behind the issue that I'm talking to you guys about, it might not always be there. And so I'm set to go to dental school this fall at University of Tennessee. Um, so we'll see how, how all that pans out. Um, but I also wanted to give you guys a little background on my swimming. Like I said, I'm from Tennessee, and so I started swimming at the age of four years old. Um, really, I, we have lots of lakes and stuff in Tennessee, so I grew up on the lake, and so I grew up swimming. Um, by the time I was eight years old, so in second grade, that's when I started swimming year-round. So this meant that in second grade, you're swimming two hours every single day, um, and it really only gets worse. I guess I should say it gets harder. It really only gets harder from there. Um, by the time you get to middle school, high school, you're swimming before school. You get in the car, you go to school, you come back from school, you rush right back to practice again, you're shoveling your food down in the car. Um, you finish practice, you go home, you do your homework, you eat your dinner, um, go to bed, you do it all again the next day. And so, Really all of that to say that it's a lifelong journey. Um, I've dedicated 18 years of my life to achieving maximum performance in my sport, which I want to mention is not just practicing in your sport. It's of course your diet, your sleep schedule, um, your physical rehab you have to do, your weightlifting, of course your sport specific training. There's so much that goes into maximizing your performance. And so, I was fortunate enough that I was pretty heavily recruited, um, but I ultimately knew I wanted to go to the University of Kentucky. Um, both of my parents were D1 athletes, my dad was an SEC athlete, and so I have strong ties to the SEC, and so I chose UK. Um, and I loved it. I got there my freshman year, um, and I had a pretty good freshman year, nothing overly crazy. I knew, of course, I was capable of more. And so my sophomore year, we came back, um, and I was doing really amazing things. And then March, my sophomore year, which I'm sure a lot of you guys dealt with as well, COVID, of course, took the world, took the U.S. by storm. Um, March was when we were supposed to leave for NCAA championships my sophomore year, but three days or so before we were supposed to leave is when everything got shut down, and so it felt like we had trained all year for nothing. 
And so we all got sent home. And swimming is not a sport typically. You get any time off. So, of course, when we first got told we were going home, I was like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. I'm so excited. We get a break. Um, but I quickly realized that I honestly didn't really enjoy the break because I knew I had to come back to swimming eventually. Um, and it was scary. It was a scary thought. You know, you, you feel like you're getting out of shape. And so, like I said, being from Tennessee where there's lots of lakes, um, and of course, no pools were open, no gyms were open. Um, I put on a wetsuit every single day, and I swam miles aimlessly in a lake to continue improving. And so finally, we came back junior year. Um, and truthfully, I was in a really good spot. Um, I had continued improving during that time, whereas a lot of my competitors and my teammates and such, they didn't have the same opportunities that I had. Um, so I came back junior year, and I did really well. Um, I was able to become an All-American, meaning finish top eight in the country. Um, but I knew my senior year I could accomplish even more. And that's when I really set the goal to win a national title, which would, of course, be becoming the fastest swimmer in the, in the nation in my event. And so senior year rolls around, um, and it actually looked as if I was going to get a chance to do that become a national champion. Um, about November of my senior year, which is about the middle of our season, um, our season goes from about October to March. Um, so November, close to the middle, I was ranked third in the country um, behind one amazing female athlete who I knew super well, because like in most sports, um, your top tier athletes, they know of each other, regardless of where you compete in the country, because you've grown up competing against each other. Um, but the swimmer who was ranked first was a swimmer that I had never heard of before. Um, and this was the first time that I became aware of a swimmer named Leah Thomas. And so, again, unbeknownst to me um, at the time that this was a biological male, there was a couple of red flags. One being this was a senior who came out of nowhere her senior year. That was pretty rare. Two, this was the swimmer from University of Pennsylvania, which is not a school that historically produces fast swimmers. So if you think about basketball, you know, Kentucky's always pretty good at basketball. You always have Duke, you always have North Carolina, certain schools. And UPenn was not a school that historically produced fast swimmers. So that was kind of a red flag. And kind of my third red flag was that this swimmer was ranked first, and if not first, really close to first, in the top three from everything from the 100 freestyle, which is of course a sprint, and all of the freestyle events in between until the mile, which is, of course, a distance event. So if you think about this, like your Olympic runners, um, your best 200 meter runner is not your best marathon runner. It's two totally different systems you're using. And so these were kind of all the red flags kind of going on in, in my head. Um, and really none of it truthfully made sense until a few days after these nation leading times were posted an article was posted disclosing that Leah Thomas was formerly Will Thomas and swam three years on the men's side at UPenn before transitioning to the women's side. And so when I found this out, I was of course shocked because this was not something I ever foresaw happening in the sport of swimming, especially at the collegiate elite level. Um, and so I was able to look up at this point who Will Thomas was because me and my teammates, we were curious, you know, is this someone who went from leading the nation to continuing to lead the nation? Or is this someone who, you know, was kind of ranked middle of the pack? You know, what, what did this look like? And so upon looking up who Will Thomas was, um, we were able to see that Will had, at best, in the men's category, ranked 462nd amongst the other men. And so when I found this out, um, I was pretty relieved because I thought the NCAA would see this exactly how we saw it. Nothing opinionated about it, just the sheer facts of it, that this was a biological male who went from ranking in the 400s, 500s, um, to now leading the nation in multiple events. But that's not how the NCAA saw it. Um, they saw nothing wrong with this, and so about three weeks before NCAA championships, which was about a year ago to date, really, um, because this was in March of last year, so almost a full year ago. Um, they announced, seems to have announced that Leah Thomas would in fact be competing with the women at this meet. Um, 
And I know it's impossible to speak for every single person on that pool deck, but I can wholeheartedly attest to the number of tears I saw from the girls who placed ninth and 17th, who missed out on being named an All-American by one place. And I can wholeheartedly attest to the extreme discomfort in the locker room. And I can wholeheartedly attest to the grumbles of anger and frustration from these girls who had worked so hard, just like myself, to get to this point. And so, that first day of competition was the 500 freestyle, which is not an event that I competed. And so, I sat on the sidelines and watched as, during prelims, I sat on the side of the pool and watched as Leah Thomas um, qualified for finals, qualified first, and this girl, she had swam in one of the previous heats, and I, I didn't know her at the time, um, and she was standing right beside me, and we're both watching the final heat, which Leah Thomas was in, to see who would qualify for finals, um, and this girl, her name is Rega. She went to Virginia Tech. She's a fifth year, she's actually from Hungary, and so she stayed, because of COVID, we got an extra year if you wanted to take it, which I did not, I was so ready to be done swimming, but Rekha did, um, because she wanted to become an All-American. And so we're standing on the side of the pool together watching, and she knew she was on the cusp of making finals, not making finals. And so we're sitting there watching, and she found out she placed 17th, which means she did not make top 16 to come back and become an All-American. And so, Standing next to her, she looks at me, again, I didn't know her, with tears in her eyes and says, I just got beat by someone who didn't even have to try. And so fast forward to finals that night. Um, again, standing on the side of the flag is Leah Thomas, beats every female in the country, including many US Olympians, American record holders, the most impressive female swimmers this country has ever seen, um, by body lengths, which is seconds. And swimming is a sport where um, seconds is a lot. This is a sport that's measured down to the hundredth of a second. So when you have someone beating every other person in the country by, you know, seconds or more, that's an anomaly. And so that was the first day of competition. And the second day of competition was the 200 freestyle, which is an event that I did compete in. And so we raced, we both qualified for finals. Um, and that night, of course, we raced again. And almost impossibly enough, we tied, which meant we went the exact same time, again, down to the hundredth of a second. I believe our time was one minute, 43 seconds, and 52 one hundredths or something like that. And so upon tying, um, you go behind the awards podium and the NCAA official, you get marched out, you stand on the podium, they hand you your trophy, and you're named an All-American. So we go back there, and the official looks at both Thomas and myself and says, Great job, um, you guys tied, we have one trophy, the trophy goes to Leah. And so, I, I understand, of course we tied, I understand of course there's one trophy, but I was curious, you know, why, what was the thought process here? Why was it so easy for him to make this decision? Um, which I wanna reiterate, I didn't really even care for the trophy, the tangible trophy, I'm a 12 time All-American, so I have lots of those at home, it wasn't the trophy, um, but I, I asked him, I said, okay, you know, I understand we tied, but why are you giving this trophy to Leah? And he said, he was pretty taken aback by this because no one had questioned anything the NCAA, NCAA had done up until this point. And so he kind of stumbled and he was like, well, uh, you know, we're just doing this in chronological order. And I said, okay, well, can you inform me what we're being chronological about? Because uh, Maybe I'm missing something, but I don't understand. And he said, well, Leah has to hold the trophy for photo purposes. You can pose with this one, but you will give it back. You go home empty handed. Leah takes the trophy home. And so truthfully, it was this that thrusted me into taking a public stance that allowing biological men into women's sports is harmful to women. Um, I, of course, knew the unfair advantage to which we were at was wrong, and I, of course, knew the locker room setting was wrong, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but when the NCAA reduced everything that myself and my teammates, everything we worked our entire lives for, when they reduced that to a photo op to validate the identity and the feelings of a biological male at the expense of us as female athletes, that's when I had had enough. Um, because up until this point, I was waiting for someone who was supposed to be protecting us to 
protect us. Um, coaches, parents, um, someone within the NCAA, someone with some sort of political power, just someone who was more equipped than I to say something. But that's not what we were seeing. And then it kind of hit me that, you know, if, if we as female athletes aren't willing to stick up for ourselves, how could we expect someone else to stick up for us? And so that's kind of how I got here and really what thrusted me into the position that I'm in. Um, but I did want to kind of touch on the locker room piece because piece, I know I mentioned it. Um, we were not forewarned that we would be sharing a locker room with Leah Thomas. Um, and so that first day again of competition, I'll kind of set the scene. A swimming locker room is not necessarily a place of modesty. Um, it's a place of chatter. You get to see your friends, especially at the national level competitions from all over the country who you haven't seen in so long. So there's so much chatter um, in these suits you wear. If you hold it up to your body outside of the water, it, it's like this big. <laughs> you have to like stuff yourself in it pretty much. And so it takes at least 15 minutes to put yourself in these suits. Of course, 15 minutes to which you're fully exposed. And so that first day of competition, um, we were in the locker room and all of a sudden, like I said, it was loud, chattery, and all of a sudden it gets dead silent. And so I have my back towards the rest of the locker room and so I turn and that's when, of course, we saw a six foot four, again, biological male equipped with an exposing male genitalia. Um, and so I immediately left the locker room, you know, kind of shocked by this because again, I knew we would be competing, but I didn't know what this situation would look like. And so I went up to the NCAA official, um, just one who was on the pool deck, and I, I asked, you know, what were the guidelines in place that kind of allowed this to happen? Because we weren't told this would be an arrangement, and you know, bare minimum, I thought we should have at least been told about this so we could make proper arrangements for ourselves if we wanted to. Um, and this NCAA official said, oh, well, we got around this by making the locker rooms unisex, which meant that any male could have walked into our locker room. And they didn't even tell us. So this meant that any coach, any of the officials on the deck, they could have walked in, and we were not forewarned. Um, so that's what that piece kind of looked like. And so I, um, there was lots of media and reporters at the meet and things like that, and they were desperately baiting people to do an interview. They would find our Instagrams and our social medias and different things, and they were reaching out to essentially all the people, trying to get someone to bite the hook. And so I kind of reluctantly agreed to do one because I knew I called my athletic director and I said, hey, you know, this is how I feel. This is what happened. This is how, you know, the rest of at least the University of Kentucky's team feels. How do you feel if I take a public stance on this? And he encouraged me, actually. He said, you know, speak your heart. I support you no matter how you feel, no matter what stance you take. I support you. You're our athlete. We love you. Speak your heart. Um, which now, hearing stories from athletes in the same situation from swimmers at other universities, that is such a rarity to have someone within your administration, within your athletic department, tell you to speak your heart. I have not encountered anyone else who has had that same experience, and so I think that's truthfully a blessing. Um, but ultimately, I agreed to do, it was the Daily Wire. Um, and that story, that interview, it really blew up. And I was not expecting that. I didn't know what it was really going to look like. And of course, that turned into more media, um, Fox News, obviously a lot of different right-leaning media outlets. And so it was good at first. I felt like the story was getting out. But truthfully, I felt like I was preaching to the choir. You know, these aren't the people who need to hear this. You know, these people already agree with what I'm saying. How can I get the people who don't agree with what I'm saying to listen to me? And so I started reaching out to CNN and different left-leaning local sites and different places, and every single one denied me. Every single one said, we don't want you to come on. We don't want you to spread your hate here. Which me, at the time, I'm like, my hate? I'm not saying anything opinionated. I'm strictly sharing exactly what happened. Um, so that was really hard. And that shows, I think, how easy it is to get labeled as some right-wing grifter, which I very much have in this case, because that's who will talk about this. Um, so I kind of wanted to highlight that. Um, but my parents always told me it's either put up or shut up. I, 
you know, you can complain all you want, you can keep doing this media all you want, but if you're not willing to do something to make a change, then you're just whining. And that's how I felt. So, of course, my goal was to enact a change. So what happened to myself and my teammates and other girls around the country, it wouldn't happen again to another um, girl. And so I started getting involved on the legislature side, which I hate more than anything that this issue has become political. Sports is the one thing that should never become political. Um, which it's so silly, but I, I realized that legislature was ultimately what's going to enact changes. And so I started getting involved in different state legislature, helping write bills, helping um, going to different states to testify. My main mission was to protect the collegiate level because I totally understand the argument to be had that, of course, younger sports you know, elementary school, middle school, it's more recreational. But once you get to that high school level where you're competing for scholarships, and once you're, of course, at the collegiate level where you're on a scholarship and it's what's paying for your school, it's a lot of times um, people's future, those categories need to be protected. And so that was my mission. Um, and so far there have been 19 states that have passed some sort of fairness in women's sports bills. Um, 14 of which being at the collegiate level, um, with lots more states in the process of doing so. Um, so that's kind of at the state level, but now at the federal level, um, that is not the case for any other university. Um, I've talked to girls from all over, parents from all over. I've talked to several of Leah Thomas's teammates, um, which they've informed me of what they had to go through on a day-to-day -day basis including they were forced to go to mandatory LGBTQ meetings to educate themselves. Um, they were, when they were initially concerned about the locker room aspect, and they sent an email to their administration saying, you know, we're uncomfortable, their administration responded with, if you feel uncomfortable seeing male genitalia, here are counseling resources that you should seek. And then again, we'll refer to the campus um, education center to educate themselves. They were told that they were not allowed to use their voice because their school has already used their voice for them. They were told that they will never get a job, they will never get into grad school, they will lose playing time, they'll lose their scholarship, they'll lose all their friends if they speak out. They were told that if they were to speak out, and any harm, rather it be emotional, physical, mental, any harm come toward Leah Thomas's way, then they are solely responsible. So these girls, they were emotionally blackmailed. Um, they're terrified into using their voice. One of Leah Thomas's teammates, um, she confided to me privately that when she was in high school, she was violently raped by someone she did not know. And so of course, this is a traumatic experience. I can't even imagine. And so when Leah began to transition and use their changing spaces, she went to her coach and said, hey, you know, this is something I really struggle with um, I love Leah, but this is really hard for me to be around this. Is there something we can do? And her coach said, no, you have to be inclusive. Um, which I think is really powerful because it shows, you know, it's more than one person, one group's mental health and identity at stake here. So then raises the question, okay, how do we choose who's to value? And I don't think there's an answer for that. Um, it's hard. How do we choose? Who weighs more? Whose feelings weigh more? Whose value weighs more? Um, and that's why there's no clear-cut solution to this problem, um, this issue. There is no clear-cut solution. Um, but now, being in this position, I've realized that it's bigger than just the fairness in sports piece. It's not just that. I know. I talked about, of course, the silencing. This is a freedom of speech issue. It's really scary if you think about it when we're living in a country that was, you know, the freedom of speech, freedom of religion, all of these freedoms that we're so fortunate to have, it's foundational. But when you lose that ability to speak, I have parents all the time tell me that they're not allowed to speak up because, you know, they work in a corporate job and, and they can't risk losing their job. And I had. I've had the, um, our, our NCAA championships was actually at Georgia Tech last year. And I had the Georgia Tech host rep in the meet, 
send me screenshots of what the NCAA said to them about how they were not allowed to use their voice. Um, and that's a bigger deal than the fairness in women's sports piece, um, the silencing piece. That's, that's really scary. Um, but now, too, we've begun changing the language we use. Now the term motherhood and breastfeeding, those are now deemed offensive. We even have the um, Cambridge Dictionary changing the definition of what a woman is. And these are objective, tru objective truths. This is a, a truth that has been there since the beginning of humanity. And we're now suddenly changing it. Um, it's also happening in prisons where you have biological men who will identify as women, so trans women, now applying to be in women's prisons. Um, a lot of these men, in the cases that I have seen, happening in New Jersey, Ohio, Kansas, and California, um, a lot of these men are convicted of heinous, terrible things like rape and child pornography and kidnapping and just awful things. But they're now applying to get into women's prisons because they understand that women typically get lesser charges and, of course, they're housed with women. Um, just in California, in recent weeks where they've seen this work, there have been over 1,200 males now identify as women, um, with 400 actually applying to go into women's prisons. Um, only one in 10 of those have been granted thus far. Um, and that's not to say that, and I truthfully don't think Leah Thomas transitioned solely to win national titles. I think that's a major misconce misconception that people think. I don't think Leah Thomas transitioned to win, and I don't think Leah Thomas transitioned to be in the women's locker room. But I hope you guys can see how this opens a door for people who would be willing to do that. Um, we have a system in place that people would take advantage of, and people are beginning to take advantage of. Um, and so I'll just kind of wrap up with a few examples. Um, I know a lot of times it's seen as a non-issue, and it's not really happening. But that could not be further from the truth. Um, I just watched a, a D3 diving conference championship where a biological male was competing against women. There's a male player on a team at University of Southern California. There's a male player at Syracuse. It's happening from, of course, the collegiate level. I just talked to a golfer who's in her 60s who is competing against a biological man. I just talked to a parent from Iowa on her six-year-old daughter's cheer team. They have a young boy who identifies, of course, as a girl and is six years old, and you're just kind of flipping your pom-poms, but this little boy is flipping up and down the court. Um, I talked to a parent in Texas who, her daughter has seven biological men on their middle school basketball team, which is their whole starting five. Um, but one of the stories that I think encompasses a lot of um, really foundational aspects of this issue is a girl named Blake Allen. Um, she's from Vermont. She's 14 years old. She's in high school. She's on her high school's volleyball team. Um, this year, they allowed a trans woman on the volleyball team. Again, they were sharing a locker room, and she walked out of the locker room and said, you know, we feel uncomfortable. Keep in mind, these are freshmen in high school. And she asked the administration, you know, is there anything I can do, we can do about this? She was expelled from school. Her dad was fired from his job um, for misgendering um, Amity. Um, and her school tried to force her. They said the only way they would allow her back in school is if she wrote an apology letter and read it to the trans um, individual, to which she wasn't willing to do because she didn't want to be forced to apologize. And so she announced a lawsuit to which her school quickly let her back in school. Um, another piece of this whole problem, or this whole issue, which I'm fortunate I didn't have to worry about is in physical contact sports, you do have to worry about your safety. Um, I could get all into the science of, you know, the percentage difference of muscle mass, of strength, of force of strike, and different things. Um, but I, I think we all do know that males, on average, are typically stronger, taller, faster, more powerful. And so in physical contact sports, like volleyball or softball, or anything where you're running at one another, throwing something at one another, striking one another, 
you do have to worry about your safety. Um, and there's been several cases. Um, there's a volleyball player in North Carolina. Um, they were playing as high school team. One high school team was playing against another team with a male on the team, which it's important to add that in volleyball, the male's volleyball net is seven inches higher than the women's net, which shows they're acknowledging the biological differences and the, the advantages that males have. But a male is playing, he jumps up, of course he spikes it. It looks like 100 miles an hour going at this girl's face, to which even months later, she's still having vision problems from being hit in the face. Um, so that's kind of the injury piece. And another piece that I think is important to touch on is prize money. There's a lot of sports where professionally or you know, semi-professionally, you make money from doing these things. And so this next example makes me wonder why I've never played disc golf. I knew nothing about disc golf, but if there's this much money in it, I should have played. Um, but there's a biological male who last year alone stole $47,000 in prize money from female athletes who rely on this for their income. Um, again, why, why are we all not playing disc golf? Um, but that's kind of that. I know you guys, it's draining being talked to. I know, have y'all had spring break yet? Spring break is coming. <laughs> it's draining being talked to. Um, so if you guys have any questions, I would love to answer. Yes? Um, so, I'm Francesca. I actually was on the swim and dive team at Cal. Oh, awesome. Year. a certain minority group, a certain marginalized group. 
I 100% acknowledge that trans people do exist and they do face real problems. Um, there's lots of problems within the trans community that 100% we as a country are not handling correctly. Um, but the sports piece. Sports is something that it doesn't really care about your feelings. Sports doesn't care about how you identify. Sports is something that solely relies on biology. And um, to kind of go off your point of Leah Thomas taking hormone suppressors for a while, do you think Leah Thomas would have won the men's division? I agree. I don't think it's it's dominating, and that's not that's not my point. Had I still beaten Leah, I know we tied, but had I had beaten Leah and Leah placed even below me, I would still be standing here doing this because it meant someone was displaced. So even not dominating, even though Leah in the hundred freestyle placed eighth that night, Leah still beat out fourteen thousand other female athletes who work hard. And so I don't I don't believe trans women are dominating, um, but I don't believe Leah Thomas would have won a national title on the men's side. And that's, that's my argument, is that this was not a lateral movement. Um, I know you mentioned to attack the system rather than the individual, and that is exactly what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to go for the system to enact changes that I believe from my experience and from talking to others would be beneficial to everyone. And I want to create a solution that works for everyone. I by no means think trans individuals should not play sports. Sports are, it's given me so many opportunities. It's given me the leadership to feel comfortable doing this. It's given me the confidence, the security. Sports are foundational, and I don't think anyone should be denied athletic opportunity. Everyone should be ensured safety. Everyone should be ensured fairness. And I think we all agree on that. And if we all agree on it, there's got to be a solution. So how can we work together to come up with the solution? Um, and there's lots of different proposed things. I personally, I think a trans only category, I don't think that's very feasible. Um, there's not, obviously there's not as many trans individuals. Two, funding, three, would it generate as much revenue? Would people watch it? You know, I, I don't think that's as feasible. But I do believe there are different solutions out there that we could work together to come up with. And we can definitely talk after, because I'd like your perspective. Did Leah win any events? Leah won the 500 freestyle the first day. Second day was the day we tied. We actually tied for fifth. And then the last day, um, Leah swam the 100 freestyle and got eighth at night which is still all American status and is still a really amazing achievement. I know eight sounds like you're getting lost in your heat, but it's it's still really incredible. Now let's take questions now. Back there. You can change your gender, gender identity. 
gender identity and sex are not the same thing, and I totally agree with that. Um, so, truthfully, I try to avoid pronouns at all costs. Um, I don't want to be disrespectful. I never want to be disrespectful. But I'm also not willing to compromise on what I believe. Um, it's hard for me to, you know, go one way or the other. I don't want to be disrespectful, but I want to stand firm in how I feel. So I try to keep it as neutral as I possibly can.
Unfortunately, it's 5 o'clock, but a big thank you to us.